So um, we're going to move on here and look at chapter 19. Um, again, there's not a whole lot of new bits in this, and a lot of it, similar to what we've done recently, is quite, um, in terms of getting the answer, it's reasonably obvious. Okay, so um, we talked about properties when we were doing metals and non-metals. So this is the like this whole material science here. This is about um, different materials, the properties they have, and how their properties make them suitable for a job, whatever that is. Like, um, uh, say me take metals because we're talking about metals. So we know that metals conduct heat. We know that they conduct electricity. Um, we know that they're quite hard, strong. Um, like kind of yeah hard like hard wearing um, so say if you wanted to make um, a frying pan would metal be a good choice of a material or would you perhaps make it out of I don't know cardboard okay so a lot of the things I've just listed are very um, make metal suitable for a frying pan. It will conduct heat, which is good. It's strong, uh, waterproof. I didn't mention, so you can wash it. Whereas if you use cardboard and try and cook your omelet in cardboard, it will catch fire. You're certainly not going to be able to wash it and reuse it, etc., etc. So, like, I know it sounds like a stupid example, but that's what this is about. Not stupid examples. This is about choosing the right material for the right job, essentially. Okay, so a material is a substance that things are made from, materials have different properties, and these are very important when choosing which material to use in a particular product. Um, sorting or classifying materials, so like, here's a couple of examples, it's, it's again, this list is not the end, so you can classify a material as a solid or a liquid or a gas, so, you know, for my frying pan, it would be very important that that's solid. Okay, I don't think of a liquid frying pan would be very useful okay so I would want solids you know what is it made of the is it made of an element a compound or a mixture and again that would depend on the properties of the element the compound or the mixture and um, is it a metal or a non-metal so I discussed that or is it natural or synthetic so natural hopefully obviously natural is something that's naturally occurring it occurs in nature synthetic is something that's made or manufactured so where they combine a couple of things found in nature and they bring them together. Maybe there might be a heating process or a cooling process. But basically, um, they take the natural things and they mess with them some way and end up with a synthetic product. So it's a, it's a product that's been made, man-made. Okay? And um, so that distinction is quite important, uh, natural and synthetic like these distinctions we've talked about actually all in the last while so the difference between solid liquid and gas elements compounds mixtures metals and non-metals they've all been discussed by recently natural and synthetic not so much so natural naturally occurring synthetic is something that's been man-made and um, so a couple of properties then uh, just to look at so every material has a different set of properties which can make it perfect for some jobs and totally useless for this so like my example of using a cardboard frying pan I mean it's utterly ridiculous it would literally be totally useless as a frying pan but you know cardboard has plenty of uses um, and it's perfect for some jobs so looking at the properties and we're going to go through each one of these but strength hardness stiffness elasticity density melting points and ability to conduct heat and electricity okay so strength I mean, if I asked you in an exam, like, what what is strength? Or you might get a list of materials, like, state which one is strong, okay? So it's the ability to resist force. Now, something I wasn't sure you'd know, is there's two types of strength, tensile strength and compressive strength. So I don't know if you've heard of tensile strength, but tensile strength is normally about, um, I suppose, the ability to... Um, so the ability to resist a pulling force would be a good way of saying it 
uh, because something that would have tensile strength would be a rope. Okay, so you wanted to have, um, if you're going to you know, hang off a cliff and use it to like abseil down the side of the cliff, you'd want it to be pretty strong in terms of you're pulling on it. So you want it to have a really high tensile strength so that it would hold you. Or like if they're using ropes and things like on building sites or something to, you know, lift up bits of steel or large window panes or, you know, stuff like that. The, the ropes would want to have a pretty high tensile strength. And then compressive strength is kind of the ability to resist a pushing force. So an example, the one I always give anyway, is like bricks, you know, like in building a house. So if you don't have, um, so say when you're building a house, obviously you put up a layer of bricks and then another layer of bricks and then another layer of bricks and so on. And that's going to continue for like most of our houses for two stories. So if the brick doesn't have a really high compressive strength, then the ones at the bottom will just get crushed by the ones above them. So they have to be able to resist the pushing force down on them by the bricks that have been built above them. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay, that's there. Anyway. Um, hardness is how difficult a material is to cut into. Um, so a good example of this is the hardest material, the hardest naturally occurring material on earth is diamond. So most, um, what are they called, like, industrial I suppose um, cutting apparatus would have a you get what's called a diamond tip on it and because diamond is so hard it will cut most other materials because it's right up kind of the top of the food chain in terms of how hard it is so if you want to cut other materials that are incredibly difficult to cut you use diamond because it's harder so yeah if you look um, most industrial saws and things like that would have diamond tips um, and that way they would be able to cut pretty much anything. Um, stiffness. Uh, a stiff material does not bend or change shape when a force is applied. Yes, yeah, so a slightly different I suppose to strong here because if you think of tensile strength, think of a rope. Okay, so if you have a, a good rope it's going to be very strong but it's not stiff. It can definitely be bent and moved around so stiffness is something that resists a change of shape so steel would be a good example of that and um, steel does not bend easily it's why it's used in um, it's used in building for like I don't know if any of you have had like an extension done or gone you know open plan where like your kitchen and your dining room and your living room are all like one room most of the time that requires what's called an RSJ which is like a big piece of steel um, to hold your house up essentially and the reason it's good is because it won't bend so like I'm literally I have an RSJ in my kitchen here and it goes from one side of my house to the other side of my house so the whole width of my house and it doesn't bow in the middle you know like it doesn't bend it, it holds its shape and it's holding up my upstairs and also my attic and um, so steel would be a very good example of a stiff material elasticity we talked about before it's how much a solid can be stretched and then return to its original size or shape. Okay, so you bend, stretch a material and allow it to, if it will return to normal, it's elastic. Uh, density, how much matter or mass there is in a certain volume. So I just got this picture. Sometimes I find density when I'm not there to show you. It's kind of hard to understand. So density is like how tightly packed the materials are. So if you look at this, so we have the yellow balls. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven yellow balls and just two blue balls. And they're on the same level, so they weigh the same, they have the same mass. So what's going on here is that the blue balls are way more dense. There's way more material packed into those blue balls than there is in the yellow balls. Because you only need two of them to get the same mass as the seven yellow balls. So it would be like, um, I don't know, if you had two identical kind of cubes on the ground. And one of them is made of polystyrene and one of them is made of lead pick up the polystyrene one and you could like you know hold it between your finger and your thumb no problem and um, 
the steel one, or what should I say, lead? The lead one would be the, the materials inside are much more tightly packed. There's much more mass in the lead cube, be much, much heavier. Okay, that's density. The lead is more dense. Uh, melting point, so uh, melting point is where a material goes from being solid to being liquid. Um, so again, depending on what it is you want the product to do, you might want to withstand quite high temperatures and still remain solid, then you need to choose an appropriate material that has an incredibly high melting point and that it won't just, you know, melt as soon as you put it into like take um I know you probably don't see it a lot anymore, but I know when I was growing up my nanny used to hold poker, you know, for the fire to kind of move the uh, coal around and stuff like that and to kind of get the fire going again. It's just a big lump of metal. Now it if for that material you chose something that melts readily, then every single time you put the poker in the fire, it's going to melt. So it's absolutely useless for that job. Okay, so melting point can be important if there's heat involved. And then the ability to conduct heat and electricity. So I suppose this works two ways. In some materials, like I was talking about frying pan earlier, you want it to conduct heat, or if you're trying to make a wire, you want it to conduct electricity. Um, so metals are really, really good for that. But on the flip side, if you don't want it to conduct, then you should use non-metals. And we talked about that. Do you remember all the properties of non-metals were basically just the opposite of the properties of metals? Yeah? So, um again depending on what you want so if you want something that's going to conduct heat or conduct electricity then you want a metal if you want something that's not going to conduct heat or electricity then you want a non-metal okay so that's pretty much all of the different properties and um, so we're just going to go on here and talk about some of the materials and um, so we have composites the main four are composites ceramics metals and polymers okay and polymers are basically just plastics okay and um, so metals we talked about metals in quite a bit of detail. Um, their strength makes them good for making things like bridges and car bodies. They're good conductors of heat. So they're ideal for cookware. And their conductivity of electrical charge makes them great for making wires. Okay, So that's just some of the properties of that material, the material being metal, that makes them good for certain jobs. Okay, But they're not good for all jobs. So just briefly to talk about plastics. So plastics are synthetic. And they're made from a substance called crude oil. Um, crude oil is like full of um, what are called hy hydrocarbons. Which is basically hydrogens and carbons. Periodic table. So it's made of a load of hydrocarbons. And they basically separate. So crude oil is kind of useless. It's this kind of smelly, thick, black substance and it's not particularly useful so what they do is they um, heat it to boiling um, so they heat it to get it to boil and then they use a process called fractional distillation So when they boil it, um, the hydrocarbons actually turn into a liquid. And then they use this process called fractional distillation to separate the now liquid hydrocarbons from the crude oil. That's essentially what they do. I'll probably put this in later, but anyway, that, that's the idea. Okay, so crude oil by itself, it contains hydrocarbons, but it's, it's pretty useless. Um, so what they do is they um, heat it up and get it to boil. That causes the hydrocarbons to turn into a liquid and they uh, use a process called fractional distillation to separate it. So you would have done some distillation last year when you did separation techniques. Let's see, you might want to go back and have a look at that. Just to remind you a little bit about if you've totally forgotten what distillation is. Um, so just a couple of properties of plastics. Uh, which you'll know from just around your house um, they're like they can be very hard like I have plastic um, like picnic wear kind of like 
cups and plates and stuff and they're that real hard plastic and then go with like a dishwasher and everything and then there's obviously like if you think of the like you know the real soft plastic that you would take off like the top of a packet of ham or something you know that's really really soft and um, so it's just completely different or like the plastic in a um a seven up bottle or a coke bottle or something so plastic's gonna be hard strong and stiff like my cutlery or crockery and my plates and bowls and stuff and some plastics have a low density so they're good for lightweight goods and some plastics are moldable so they can make, be made into different shapes so this is why plastics are and i'm like using kind of quote unquote here they're amazing as a product amazing in terms of the versatility and what they can do and um, but obviously in recent years like plastics are only around since i think the 1930s um, so the damage that they've done in that time um, oh i did have a little bit about making plastics here uh, the manufacture of plastics from crude oil simple hydrocarbons are separated from crude oil and um, oh yeah the hydrocarbons are didn't mention this they're known as monomers so the word mono means like one or single mono means single so simple hydrocarbons are separated i suppose a bit more detail up here how do they separate it they separate it by boiling it making the hydrocarbons turn into liquid and then they use a process called fractional distillation to separate them and then the monomers react together to form long chains called polymers and poly means many okay so you have your monomers that react together and become polymers and you'll notice with most plastics that they have the word poly in them and it's because of this process because they're made from this process so they're pretty much all made of polymers and um, i hear okay so we have a polythene bag polythene bottle polystyrene pvc which is polyvinyl chloride i think i'm guessing there but pvc pipes polypropylene boots and this is what i was talking about here the cutlery uh, nylon is an example of a plastic um, so just some examples there, I mean, you know there's plastics all around us. Uh, so I kind of just briefly mentioned this. Um, the reason why plastics are a problem is that they do not break down. Okay, they are not affected by air or water. Okay, so air or water doesn't affect them, and they're not biodegradable. What does biodegradable mean? It means bacteria and fungus can't break them down. That's very important. Okay, I think we use that word biodegradable and we're not really sure what it means. So bacteria and fungus, if you're, again, you would have done this last year, you didn't do this with me, sorry, I did it my first year. Um, so bacteria and fungi feed on like, um, like dead plant and animal cells and they sort of process it through their body and then that's how it's broken down. Um, but they can't eat plastic. They can't, they can't help with the breakdown of plastic. So air has no reaction with it water won't dissolve it and then bacteria and fungi which are responsible for kind of that natural degradation of things that doesn't work either okay so the first ever plastic bag will go absolutely nowhere like the first ever plastic bag from 1930 is somewhere in this world right now and it's never going to go anywhere and the only thing you can do to get rid of it is burn it but when you burn plastics, it releases poisonous fumes. Um, some fumes, like if you burn PVC, uh, the fumes are actually poisonous. And it's actually part of the reason why in like a house fire, um, people die. People can die from inhaling the poisonous fumes from PVC in their house burning. Um, now, obviously, there's plenty of other reasons why you can die in a house fire. But that's one of the one of the things. Um, and even if it isn't a poisonous gas that it's emitting, it emits carbon dioxide. So like we could go and burn all the plastic, but we could really load the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which has its own problems. So then they have developed bioplastics and they are biodegradable, which means bacteria and fungus can break them down. Um, and they're made from renewable biological sources. So that sounds like absolutely amazing. There is a problem. Of course there is. Um, they need a huge amount of energy to be manufactured. 
Okay, so the manufacturing process requires a huge amount of energy. So what do they do? They burn fossil fuels and they release carbon dioxide. And more carbon dioxide than the manufacture of regular plastics. So yes, it's way, 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 way better because it will be broken down. Um, but it has a bigger um, environmental impact in its initial stages, like in its manufacturing process. So, you know, better, but not there yet. And obviously the fact that it has a really high, um, it takes a lot of energy to make, it's going to cost more. And, you know, companies don't like spending money where they don't have to. Um, so yeah, that's just, I'm just going to throw that. Uh, that's so we talked there about uh, polymers we talked about metals so just very briefly composites and ceramics and um, so composite material is made up of at least two other materials and um, so composites are it's normally about adding strength so they do this a lot with like wood that they use um, oh what's it called plywood I don't know if you've heard of plywood, but plywood is essentially just like layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of thin wood like stuck together. And they do this on like a massive scale. Sometimes like, like they can use, they can build houses out of some of these materials. It's called laminating. So you put like one layer of material, say horizontally, and then your next layer is glued vertically and then horizontally and then vertically and then horizontally and then vertically. And you end up with this really thick wood. Like, I mean, if any of you have a laminate floor, that's essentially what they're doing. They're gluing layers and layers and layers and layers of wood together. So it's not one solid piece of wood, which is beautiful, but is not very hard wearing. So if anybody has soft wood, um, has hard or soft wood floors, they're, um, they get damaged. So if someone comes in in a pair of high heels, they'll damage the wood because, you know, wood is naturally not soft like I mean you can build houses out of it but it definitely will get damaged and um, whereas laminar floor is just layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of wood so it's incredibly hard wearing um, and it's generated in that way for additional strength and then ceramic um, it's a non-metallic synthetic mixture and there's just a couple of kind of the properties of ceramics so it's cheap it's hard it's resistant to high temperatures uh, long lasting, low density compared to metals, so uh, lighter, I suppose, and per conduction of electricity. So um, I just put up a couple of ceramic roof tiles just in case anyone wasn't sure what ceramics look like. You, you definitely have, like, I'm literally looking at a ceramic flower pot here in my house. Like, there's ceramics are kind of all around. Um, so, yeah, just to mention them because they were in the little diagram. So, that's it, and um, that's that chapter. And that's it for the summer exams. And so I'm not gonna give you any homework. Just get the notes down on this and learn what needs to be learned. Um, like again, a lot of that was reasonably obvious in terms of properties and things like that. Like, I think it was okay. You probably need to have an idea of like some properties of materials, but again, you can come up with that, like strength, hardness, elasticity, anyway, a couple of them. Uh, this would be important, so the kind of classification of different materials, composites, metals, polymers, ceramics, these are probably the most um, important, it's hard to say, but the most used, I suppose, that metals versus plastics, essentially, they're the most used. Um, I mean, you don't need a massively detailed explanation of how plastics are made, but just the general idea. Okay, it's made from crude oil. Crude oil contains hydrocarbons. They then heat the crude oil to boiling. The hydrocarbons become a liquid and then they use a process called fractional distillation to separate the liquid. It comes out as a monomer. So the hydrocarbons are monomers, so single one molecules, and then they join together. So a load of monomers join together and now you have many molecules which are called um, polymers. And that's why you'll see poly at the start of a lot of names of plastics because they're made from polymers. Okay. And um, environmental impact of plastics, I suppose, I mean, you probably know it anyway, but what does biodegradable mean? What does it mean to not be biodegradable? So that bacteria and fungi cannot break it down. Yeah. And then, like I said, very briefly, composites and ceramics. Okay, so get those notes down. Um, I have you... 
sent I'm sending an email I sent an email yesterday uh, second year science there so Wednesday at one o'clock um, just have a live class if you have any questions um, I'll do my best to answer them if there's anything I'm not sure about I will um, get back to you kind of thing but yeah if you just so you know what topics are on your exam this is the last of it if there's anything that's kind of been annoying you when you were studying and you don't understand it or anything like that just ask but have it ready there's no point in coming on and then be like oh I did have a question and trying to find it in your copy or whatever it's not going to work so yeah and if you've nothing to ask me and you're completely happy and satisfied about your test and ready to go that's absolutely fine I won't be annoyed if you don't come on to the class like it's literally just for anybody who feels they have a few questions all right so hopefully I'll chat to a few of you on Wednesday and then um, if I don't uh, the best of luck in your exam next week and obviously enjoy your summer hopefully we'll be back to normal in September